Um, cool. So welcome everybody um, to the last Next Generation Sharing of the Year. Um, so I'll open up in prayer and then we'll have, I think, it's Ati Maravik first to share and as we go. And who else um, has God lead? So um, let's just pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we just want to um, honor and praise you, Lord, tonight, Lord. Um, just lift up everyone who's sharing your word tonight, um, this morning, Lord, and that you'll be with them, Lord, and that it's you speaking through them, Lord, and not their words, Lord. Um, we just want to lift up um, everything that's happened this year to you, Lord, and pray for all the upcoming end of the year and for next year as well, Lord. Um, as we were singing, Lord, uh, reminded us, Lord, that we should be holy, Lord, and set apart to you, Lord. Um, help us to um, uh, sanctify, Lord, so we can be with you in the end, Lord. Um, and saying this, Lord, just uh, lift up today and um, help us uh, continually seek you in everything we do. Um, amen. Good morning everyone, today I am sharing a testimony. So this is a testimony of how God used my painful ordeal to overcome my fear for a bigger responsibility and realize my potentials. So indeed, God has better and bigger plans for us, so we need to trust Him and ride the tide of life. So this is my story. Last year, I shared about my failed pregnancies. Um, my last miscarriage almost put me to the bottom low. I was so down, depressed, and deeply and gravely hurt. I know I have to do something to get out of that closet of sadness. I had been praying to God, but it seemed like He was ignoring me. I was overwhelmed with so much emotions, and I feel like the devil was taking advantage of my weakness. I got too angry at God because of what had happened. I felt so hopeless and demotivated. And then one day, out of nowhere, I just felt that desire to learn something. Something that will distract me and keep me on my toes. And that's when the idea of driving came about. <laughs> if you know me, driving is not in my to-do list or bucket list. I remember I had dreams of driving a car before, but I never showed any interest in real life. You may be probably wondering why. It's because growing up, my mom never wanted us, her children, to drive. She was afraid that we will get um, involved in an accident. It's a cliche because um, my dad is a mechanic, and he works with cars, but was not able to teach his children to drive. So whenever my dad will attempt to teach my brother, my mom will keep screaming and shouting to stop. And she was afraid that my brother will get into trouble. For her, driving is only for adults and for men. So sex is a... <laughs> None of her sisters or aunts who are based in the Philippines know how to drive. So anyway, what I'm trying to say is that I never saw myself driving a car. I would rather walk a mile than drive a car. <laughs> but then upon living in Wellington for more than eight years, I realized that that kind of mindset will not work for long. I forgot to consider the following. So I have four points here. I am not forever young 
and full of energy that I can always walk at these times. I can actually feel some muscle pains now, <laughs> especially after leaving first. <laughs> Second is that I am living in a country where buses do not stop in front of our house. <laughs> there is a designated bus stop and you are lucky enough if your house is near a bus stop. This is contrary to what we used to do in the Philippines. In the Philippines, we can ask the jeepney drivers to stop wherever we want. <laughs> There is no such thing as jeepney stop. So I'm not sure though if this has changed now. Please correct me if I'm wrong. The third is that the unforgiving weather sometimes makes it difficult to travel on public transportation, especially if you need to transfer from one bus to another. There are times that bus schedules do not coincide with each other. You are lucky if there are no cancellations, but still you need to wait a couple of minutes for the next bus. And the last one is that I will have a child that will go to a daycare or to school. You see, my mindset when, when I was younger was only focused on the present or as far as I can foresee. I failed to consider that my situation might change and only God knows. I didn't even know that I will build a life here in New Zealand. <laughs> anyway, moving on. I studied for my learner's exam secretly. I didn't tell Daryl about my plan as I don't want to raise his expectations. <laughs> if I fail, then at least no one will know except me. So on November 8, 2019, a month after my miscarriage, I took my exam and passed the test. And so I gained my learner's license. I was exci so excited to tell my husband about my small victory. I didn't know how to tell him and waited for the perfect timing. That perfect timing was while he was washing the plates. <laughs> <laughs> I asked him if he can teach me to drive. He didn't believe me at first and advised me to get my learner's <laughs> license first. I showed him the piece of paper which, which was my temporary license ID. He still didn't believe me <laughs> and even jokingly said that the paper was a counterfeit, <laughs> that I had it produced from recto. <laughs> so for those who are not familiar with recto, recto is a place in Manila very popular for producing or creating counterfeit IDs. <laughs> <laughs> Daryl was in great denial of my learner's license because we had a deal before. He will learn to cook when I get at least my restricted license. <laughs> Mind you, I had my restricted license for three years now, and Daryl still hasn't started his learners and cooking. Unfair, eh? <laughs> to this date, I'm still patiently waiting for that time that he will be ready to start her, his learners. No pressure, dear. There, dear husband. Um, I'll probably ask Tita Bernie to be the testing officer when he gets his, lear his restric restricted license in cooking. Let's see if he will pass. <laughs> so after passing my learners, they, there came the harsh reality. I have to learn to drive and my husband will be my instructor. Uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> it was not an easy start for me. Learning to drive when you're in 30s is different when you are younger. My level of confidence and bravery decreases as I age based on my observation. I can't remember how many times Daryl and I argued while I was driving or how many times Daryl has to skip meals because I was too annoyed at him <laughs> and cannot prepare food. <laughs> I've heard before that um, you should not ask your closest kin to teach you to drive as they keep their comments too frank and personal. But I have no choice at that time as driving lessons are a bit pricey. I need to persevere and set my emotions aside. I always remind myself the reason why I'm doing it and my ultimate goal, which is to drive on my own. 
a month before my scheduled practical exam, I decided to have a proper driving lesson with an instructor. I will never forget what, what this instructor told me. It is the same road and the same rules wherever you go in New Zealand, so don't be afraid to drive. This man was so good that I felt fairly confident that I will pass my driving test. And yes, certainly, I did pass my exam and gained my, gained my restricted license. There was one thing that the testing officer told me that I kept reminding myself. He said, you have to drive for yourself. I think the same thing applies in our spiritual life. We have to do it for ourselves, for our salvation, and hopefully we can influence other people around us through our way of life. You are the will, you are on the will, and you have control over your life. After that, I have driven a couple of times on my own. I was so happy that I can go to places without taking the bus or without asking the husband to drive for me. The farthest that I've driven to is Palmy, when Faith had her wedding dress fitting. We, d we nearly got into a serious accident, but <laughs> thank God that he protected us. After that experience, I even gained more confidence. I knew that I am capable of driving. After six months, we found out that we were expecting. And because of my pregnancy history, I decided to stop driving because it stresses me out and it might affect my pregnancy. I can't afford to lose another baby. This was a very good excuse not to drive again. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoyed just, just being the passenger, especially when, when you are traveling, like in Queenstown. Do you agree? <laughs> okay, after having Eliana, Daryl keeps on reminding me that I should drive again. I keep on pushing it back as I am nursing and stress might affect my milk supply. Plus, we sold our other car and we only have one car. You see, I never run out of excuses because <laughs> I really don't want to drive again. But recently, our situation has changed. That cat, my cousin, who used to take care of Eliana, had gone home because we were not able to renew her visa. This means that I have to go back to driving as Eliana needs to go to a daycare. I cannot look after her and work at the same time. So after more than two years since the last time I drove, I am behind the wheels again. <laughs> All my fears came back. The first time I drove, I remember asking God, God if this was my time. <laughs> I asked God that if it if it is my time, please look after my child. I was not able to sleep that night after my practice driving. I don't know if it was because of my adrenaline rush <laughs> or I was too afraid that I might commit a mistake. Too many things going on in my mind. Today, I have been driving for five weeks now, but I still feel the fear whenever I am on the wheels. The intensity of fear has lessened each day, and I thank God for that. It is a different feeling when your passenger is your child, <laughs> plus the fact that it is difficult to focus when she was crying. But I have to persevere because God has put me into this situation for a reason. Yes, I can drive, but I can only drive from our house to the daycare. <laughs> And to a few places where I can easily park my car. My parking, still, my parking skills is still a work in progress, progress, so don't ask me to drive to unfamiliar places. <laughs> so lessons learned from this experience. First is, listen to God's instruction. You never know when he will put you into that difficult situation. And the only way to get out of it is through the knowledge and skills he asks you to gain. While we have time, seek him and spend more time with him. Use the talents he has given you for his ministry. It is actually a blessing that I learned to drive before having a child as I was able to focus on my goal. Second is, God will not put you into a difficult situation without preparing you. Never doubt what God can do for you. Third is, ask for God's guidance and protection in whatever you do, especially for the drivers. 
there are too many risks on the road. Last is your life, your choice, so leave it to glorify God. Um, before I end this testimony, I want to share the Bible verse that God has given me to remind me of this experience. This is in Psalm 121. It says, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. So, if God is instruct, instructing you to do or act on something, act on it while there is still time. So that ends my statement. <laughs> Thank you. Amen. <laughs> Anything to add? <laughs> <Not sure. laughs> Any driving tips? Or <laughs> okay, it's my turn. Um, so I'm just going to be sharing about what I've been reading lately. And it all started because I watched this video on YouTube of one of the survivors from the Nova Festival uh, from the attack on October 7. Um, and I'm not really someone that likes to watch too much of those things because it can consume me quite easily, um, seeing the reality of like how bad the world is. And um, but I was watching them anyway. And um, I feel like I learned a lot from it, so I'm just going to share it. Um, so the one of the testimonies that I saw was this 30-ish, I don't know how old he is or even his name, he didn't mention it, but um, he was about 30 years old. He was a guy who was an attendee of the festival and he said that he was working there. He had his own like massage um, station at the festival. Um, we already know that the festival is not a godly festival. Uh, it was a pagan festival, and people there believed in stuff like spirituality. And um, a lot of the testimonies that I watched, people were actually saying that um, they were fully wasted when the attack happened. And yeah, under the influence, and on top of that, it was like at 6 a.m. in the morning when they came. So imagine trying to protect yourself during such an attack if you're completely wasted and you got no idea what's going on and you're just fully not prepared. Um, he talks about what he saw. He said that first he saw the missiles and then he heard gunshots and then eventually he saw people dropping like ducks and people that he even knew. Luckily he had his own Jeep so he was able to pick up some of his friends and he was just driving from place to place looking for a place to hide. Um, but even while he was driving, there were people trying to shoot at him. And um, he even said that his friend in the car got shot in the head and he showed this picture of his friend's head and yeah, he got badly injured. Um, but finally, they found a toilet in a marketplace and they were able to go in there and barricade themselves in the toilet and hide. And at this point of the video, he was at the pretty much at the climax of what he was saying, saying that they were in this toilet and he could hear um, Arabic, he could hear the gunshots closing in and the terrorists all around him. So he started saying the Shema. He was saying Shema Israel, Shema Israel, Shema Israel. He was he was shouting it, and he said that he really thought that he was about to die. Um, after six hours of hiding, finally they heard their own language, the language of the IDF. And because they heard that, they were able to escape, and they realized that it was safe to leave the toilet. Um, when I was watching it the first time, because I think he must have filmed this pretty much the day after or something, he was speaking very fast. So I feel like I couldn't take it all in. But I was telling Mark about what I saw, and when I t 
told him about it, I started to realize um, what happened. And it was, what hit me was that it was this guy, this Jew, who I don't think is a practicing Jew because he was at a pagan festival, um, who was probably under the influence or wasted, thought that he was about to die. And in that moment when he thought he was about to die, he knew about the Shema and he knew how to pray it. And he decided to pray it in that time where he thought he was gonna die. So is it likely that he believed in God? Maybe not because he was at this festival, but he knows of the Shema, he knows of God. And he decides to call on him right before he believes he's going to die. So we've learned about the Shema before. It's a prayer that's based on Deuteronomy 6, where the Jews believe to be one of their holiest prayers. So the people who are practicing, they recite this prayer at least twice a day, in the morning and at nighttime before they go to bed. Some, I read, even uh, say it even more than that, up to four times a day. And they say that they also pray this prayer during Yom Kippur at the climactic part of Yom Kippur. Um, and it also said on my research that some people say it, the Shema as their last words, which is maybe why he was saying it as well. Um, but when you read the Shema, you understand why they pray it so many times. So I'm going to read the Shema in English. <laughs> Although I did try to learn it in Hebrew. You can ask Mark about that, actually. Um, but yeah, so the Shema says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be the name of the glory of his kingdom forever and ever. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words which I command you today shall be upon your heart. You shall teach them thoroughly to your children, and you shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk on the road, when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign upon your hand, and they shall be for a reminder between your eyes. And sh you shall write them upon your door, stop, door posts of your house and upon your gates. And it will be if you will diligently obey my commandments, which I enjoin upon you this day, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. I will give rain for your land at the proper time, the early rain and the late rain, and you will gather in your grain, your wine, and your oil. And I will give grass in your fields for your cattle, and you will eat and be satisfied. Take care lest your heart be lured away, and you turn astray and worship alien gods and bow down to them. For then the Lord's wrath will flare up against you, and he will close the heavens so that there will be no rain and the earth will not yield its produce, and you will swiftly perish from the good land which the Lord gives you. Therefore, place these words of mine upon your heart and upon your soul, and bind them for a sign on your hand, and they shall be for a reminder between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children to speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk on the road, when you lie down and when you rise, and you shall inscribe them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates so that your days and the days of your children may be prolonged on the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give them for as long as the heavens are above the earth. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and tell them to make for themselves fringes on the corners of their garments throughout their generations and to attach a thread of blue on the fringe of each corner. They shall be to you as zit and you shall look upon them and remember all the commandments of the Lord and fulfill them. And you will not follow after your heart and after your eyes by which you go astray, so that you may remember and fulfill all my commandments and be holy to your God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I, the Lord, am your God. So you can see there why they say it that many times in the day because it says that you need to have them on your heart, speak of them when you sit at home and when you walk on the road, when you lie down and when you rise. It also says, bind them on your hands and they shall be a reminder between your eyes. Have them on your doorposts of your house and upon your gates. So it really sounds like every waking moment, God wants them to remember and to look to God and his commands. And during all the times that I've read this, what this is based off, which is Deuteronomy 6, um, the main message that I would get is that, yes, God wants us to keep his word with us at all times and everything that we do, that we wouldn't forget him. Um, 
that we would include him and remember what is right. Um, which is true that, you know, that is part of why he wants us to do it. Um, but it's when I heard this non-practicing Jew, this guy who was at this festival, you know, broken and thinking that he was about to die and praying it, that I realized that the main reason why God gives us these commands is because he wants us to be saved. He loves us and he wants, he wants you to have that, that in the case that you are at this point where you are able to repent, that you can call upon him. And when you read the commandments and when you read stuff like this, sometimes straight away, because it sounds like rules, do this, do this, do this, you just see the, the face value of it. Okay, God wants me to do this so I don't forget him. God wants me to do this so that this happens. But the intention of everything that he tells us to do is because he wants to be reconciled with us and because he loves us. And um, can you imagine if we did follow these commands? Um, if every morning when we wake up that we would love the Lord our God with all our heart and every time we sit at home and when we talk to people and when we teach our children that this would through and through be everything about us would there be a chance like if we were ever able to do this which we are not because we're sinful um, but God is telling us to do these things to maximize the chance of us ever coming to repentance and what like again when we read it as rules we think God wants us to do this because he wants this for him but it's not for him and he does not need us he does not need our praise or glory or whatever because he's God, but he wants us. And even people who don't know him at all and people who go to these festivals and worship other gods, he even wants them as well. And so um, another thing that God does is that stuff that Uncle Wark's been sharing lately, which is about his foreknowledge, that God foreknows everything. He knows who will repent. He knows how sinful we are going to be, how sinful we were, and all the sins that we're ever going to commit. And he knows how stubborn the Jews are. He knows what he will have to do to wrestle with Jacob so that there is a remnant that can be saved. Um, this guy that I watched, I don't know how he knows the Shema. Probably, maybe, when he grew up, it was something that he was forced to say out of tradition and ritual. He might not understand it fully. Uh, it might be meaningless to him, but because God said, gave these commands and wanted to ingrain his words in his people, he planted a seed. And in that weak moment of his life, when he thought he was about to die, he calls upon God to save him. Um, I don't know what happened to that guy. I don't know if he he genuinely repented in that situation, or if now after everything's been done, if he's gone back to whatever he believed in before, or I don't know anything about him. Um, but now I pray for that guy. And um, I never understood fully, like, because Uncle Wark tells us to pray for people that we don't know. And, you know, to go on YouTube and to watch, watch something and to pray for that person. And I never fully understood it until I watched this video and I don't know, I don't know this guy. <laughs> I don't know this guy and I don't know the people who are who survived the festival but now I'm praying for them that you know God loves them so much that he gave them these commandments and I'm praying that they would know that Jesus is involved in all of this because even if they believe in God they might not believe in Jesus um, but is nothing is by accident it's not by accident that God tells Israel to pray this prayer and all that they do and to hold tightly to his word. He purposefully tells them to do these things so that they, even in their stubbornness, might one day take this to heart and at the right time genuinely repent and be saved. You can see God's unfailing love and his desire for everyone to be saved and his will to do everything that he can, absolutely can to uphold his covenant and to even above that, not just to uphold his part of the covenant, but to help us, to help us to choose him and uphold our part of the covenant as well, if we remain in him. Um, it's by his mercy that he gave 
these commandments, it's not because he is a dictator or again, because he needs anything from us. It's because of his mercy that he allow, allows the tribulation that is going to come and that is happening. Um, and even worse, it's he allows the um, time of Jacob's trouble, which we know will be unmatched. Not because he wants to see people suffer, but because he foreknows who will repent and what needs to happen in order for as many people to repent. And I just wrote here, who else can say that they follow a God like our God? Who is perfect and lacks nothing, but still desires to save sinners like us? Who not only paid the price and gave up their only son, you know, he gave up his only son and he was crucified and then he resurrected, but then that was never the end of the story. And until now and until the end of time, he will walk with us and he will help us to remain on the narrow path if we choose to remain in him. Um, it's become more and more apparent to me how much God desires to save everybody. Um, I just put here a few weeks ago when Queer Ayer brought up Jay, um, we were able to pray for him. And then a few days later, he passed away. And then I was reminded about when Ati Anne was sick, she was brought to our attention. So we prayed for her, and shortly after, she also passed away. So there are no coincidences. Things um, are getting hard, and I think one of the hard things is, you know, you have people that you love and that you know, and you're not sure if they're going to be saved. And on top of that, yourself, you know, you're not, you know you're not perfect, and you ask yourself, can I even be saved? Um, it gets to the point, yeah, where it feels like, how many can be saved? Am I strong enough to give up this life and my own desires to remain on the narrow path? Or am I strong enough to go against the grain, um, to stand up for what I believe in when times get really tough? But I guess this is why I'm sharing this. It is because God is mighty to save. And his love is so unfailing that he says, mercy triumphs over judgment. Um, when I was writing the conclusion, I was reminded of Uncle Warwick sharing about the man who was living in the tombs, who was cutting himself with stones, and he was crying out day and night. He has no idea who Jesus is, and he has zero faith. He wasn't seeking Jesus at all, but that didn't matter because God was seeking him. He didn't need the man's faith because God himself is faithful and he will do whatever it takes to save those who will repent. So while it seems impossible for anyone to be saved, this is the God that we serve, who upholds his end of the covenant, but also does everything he can in his will for us to uphold our end as well. Um, everything he does is for our salvation and for our reconciliation with him. Um, so yeah. That's actually the end of my sharing. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. That's all. Thank you. Do you, you. Want, to, you want to pray? I'll yeah. teach you. I'll teach everyone. <laughs> Come on. Sure. <laughs> okay. Not on, the, not on their menu, but let's do it. It's, okay. So this is uh, adjusted for Christians. It's very short. Okay, so I'll do it in parts and then we'll throw. So the first part everyone knows. Shema Yisrael. Shema Israel. Hear, O Israel. Okay. Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai Eloheinu. Adonai Echad. Adonai Echad. The Lord your God, the Lord is oneness. Okay. Baruch. Baruch. Hashem. Hashem. Blessed is the name. Malkuto la olam va'ed. Malkuto. La olam va'ed. So I'll say it's best when you say that all together. So Baruch Ota, uh, sorry, Baruch Hashem, Malkuto la olam va'ed, is blessed is the name, the glory of his kingdom or his rule has no ending. In other words, he is God eternal. And then the Christianized part, normally you stop there for the simple Shema. But for Christians, we add on the bottom, Yeshua Hu HaMashiach. Yeshua Hu HaMashiach. Jesus, who is the Messiah. Okay? You can just leave it like that. 
because the Shema is a, is a Jewish prayer to God, but not specifically to Jesus. So when we're praying, if we want to pray that, we can put our signature on the bottom. Okay, should we try one more time? Shema Yisrael Adonai Elohenu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuto Laolam Ve'ed Yeshua Hu HaMashiach Hu Adon HaKol Lord of the Universe Okay there, you did it. So now Mark can't give you a hard time anyway. So I guess it's my turn now. <laughs> um, yeah, so so this, this is sort of a... I went about this a little bit differently to um, how I'd usually do a sharing. This is a bit of a, a reflection. Um, and yeah, because I think this year has been uh, a year of, I think, really high highs, but also just really low lows. Um, uh, learning how to be a parent, um, taking on uh, more responsibilities at work, dealing with family and friends, um, and then on top of everything, just everything that's happening around the world, and it's it's been a really overwhelming year, and I think a lot of us m m may think the same, but at the same time, um, uh, God is good, and Everything that does happen um, is happening for a reason. And I know he's been giving us his word um, to keep us on the narrow path through all of that. And so I spent the last week just um, not trying to read anything really new, but just reading over the sermons this year and um, just stuff from Bible studies and just what God has been sharing to us through, or to me, um, in, in my walk um, this year. And I came to the point where I, I think the, the, one of the main things that he's, or that's been pressed on me is, is that, that God is the owner of everything on this earth. Not even just the possessions, but everything that happens on this earth, including life itself, is under his control. And one thing that I want to take into my walk going forward, and I'll talk about it as I go, um, but it's learning to be a servant and a steward. Um, one of the parts of the Bible that I re recently went back to is John 15. And there's two parts of this chapter in particular. Uh, first is about the vine and the branches, where God is the gardener, Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. So it's John 15, 1 to 5. Uh, it says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So, so no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine, in, in Jesus. And apart from me, which is Jesus, you can do nothing. And so... Being led to this passage, I, I think this was a reminder to me that our, our ability to be fruitful is not our own doing. And it's only through Jesus and through his grace that if we remain in him, that he would remain in us. And 
this is what allows us to become fruitful. And on top of all that, we have a God who is, who is the gardener, who's constantly pruning, pruning us as branches. And all these trials that we, in the moment, complain about, or um, things that we just don't understand at the time, just everything that happens in our lives that he, that he puts us through or allows to happen um, there so that we would become fruitful. Or um, at the other end, if, if we just won't bear fruit and he foreknows this, that's when he cuts off the branches. So I, there's, there's a few things that um, I think that I could take from this. But for me right now, it's reminding myself that God is above, is above us. Um, all have sinned, all fall short, so apart from him, we can do nothing. No matter what price, so I think this is word for word from Uncle Warwick, but no matter what price we're willing to pay, only God can pay it. Which is to say that we can only en enter the covenant through him. Um, the second part from John 15 is... Um, in verse 12, and this is about um, being servants or friends to Jesus. Um, so verse 12 to 15, it says, My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I've learned from my father, I've made known to you. So after, so this is in that same chapter. So after Jesus tells the disciples that we cannot bear fruit without him um, to remain in the vine, he also says that he no longer calls them servants, but instead he calls them friends. Um, so a servant in the Bible is someone who owes a debt to a master. Um, but Jesus coming down to earth and dying for our sins, this means that we actually don't have a debt to pay because he already paid for it. Um, and to take it a step further, um, in Jesus, with Jesus also sharing his father's word, he now calls us friends. So our faith is not a dictatorship. It's, um, well, it, God is obviously in control. And he's still above us, but we are given his word um, and now have this free will to choose. Will we serve God and be grafted as branches? Or will we choose to not serve and be cut off from the vine? Um, the important thing here is that we do choose to be servants. Um, I think writing this, I'm just re reminding myself that this isn't something that we are being forced to do. We aren't being forced to serve God. And like what Ali said, that he doesn't actually need us, but he wants us. And on top of that, we can't ever actually pay him back for paying our debts. So why do we choose to be servants? And for me, it's because of the gratefulness for his sacrifice, for the greater sacrifice and for the gift of salvation. And just when you read the word, you just know it's the right thing to do. To remain, remain in me and I'll remain in you. Um, and I think the servants and stewards, and I think these words have just, they keep popping up. And there's two passages that are they're both from Luke. And they were sort of the, the main ones that I've, that I've been reading, I guess, recently. And... Uh, I'll start with Luke 12. Um, this is verses 35 to 48. Um, it says, Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning, like servants waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet, so that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself to serve, will have them recline at the table, and will come and wait on them. It will be good for those servants whose master finds them ready, even if he comes in the middle of the night or toward daybreak. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have let his house be broken into. 
You also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Peter asked, Peter asked, Lord, are you telling this parable to us or to everyone? The Lord answered, Who then is the faithful and wise manager, whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them the, their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose the servant says to himself, My master is taking a long time in coming, and he then begins to beat the other servants, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he is not aware of. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. The servant who knows the master's will and does not get ready or does not do what the master wants will be beaten with many blows. But the one who does not know and does things deserving um, punishment will be beaten with few blows. From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded, and from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Um, so, yeah, so this is, this is the passage that, so it talks about servants being dressed and ready for service, to be ready at all times, because we never know what our last day is. Um, uh, and... It also talks about being a steward, so the, a steward being the one managing the owner's house in their absence. And uh, like I said, those two words just keep popping up for me, and um, they're interconnected, but the way I've been differentiating the two is that we are servants to God, and since he possesses everything on this earth, that we are then stewards to those possessions. So we serve God, and we steward to the, the things of this earth. So, um, uh, Seth's not here, but using Seth as an example, is I serve God, and a part of serving God, he has entrusted Seth to me and Ali, and so we are stewards over him. That means we're responsible for Seth, and there's an accountability to God that comes with this, because Seth is God's, and not ours. Um, but that also means that God is Seth's real father, and I am the steward. And this can, this can feel like a lot of responsibility. Um, but First Corinthians 3 was a good one for me to meditate on, especially when the times get really tough with Seth. Um, uh, so verses 5 to 11. Uh, actually, I'll just read verse 6. So I planted the seed... Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. And I think verse 11 as well, it says, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. And the, the quick and short of this is that I need to do my part, but the outcome always comes to God who makes things grow. And... It's reminding myself that no matter what we try to do as parents is to know that God is the one that's in control. And a part of doing my part is to know what that is, and that's to be within the vine um, as a fruitful branch. Um, and, yeah, so trying to remember in all of our trials and just life is to... To, to remember who am I doing everything for, and it's for God. Um, and I think this was another thing from men's Bible study, um, and there was two, two reasons that we sort of tossed around as to um, how that actually helps us to know that um, we are stewards it's, and that we are accountable. It's, first, it's the weight of the responsibility can instill fear in us as being a weighty task, which can push us to, to do what is right, while also appreciating the weight of the purpose, this can motivate us. And I think it's that balance between those is to, to know that it doesn't just come down to us, but at the same time to know that we are responsible. And this relates to the next Luke passage, which is Luke 17, verses 5 to 10. Um, so this is about the mustard seed um, 
and the apostles say to God, increase our faith. Um, and Jesus replies, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this small berry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. Um, uh, and suppose one of you has a servant plowing um, or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't you rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready, and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. Um, so this is another one from men's Bible study that um, we talked about a while ago. But the main thing here is that the mustard seed isn't about gaining power through our faith, but understanding that God has the power to do anything if our faith is planted in good soil, which is in him. So the size of your faith isn't what matters, but what matters is that you plant it in the right soil, and that's where you have to look after it, you have to steward over it, and that's where doing your part comes in. Um, and I just wrote here as a reminder to myself that Having more faith doesn't mean bigger miracles because the Holy Spirit is actually the one that does the miracle. So what, we, what, so what do we do? We do our part, but we don't try to do God's part. And we don't expect to get the praise as if we did God's part because, like it says at the end of that passage, that we are unworthy servants. We've only done our duty. So I'm trying not to, to do things with Seth and... Um, at work and everything by my own strength or to puff myself up. We can, we can plant the seed or water it, but God is the one that makes it grow. We need to know him to know the good soil, and we are accountable to this, to do our part as stewards. Um, but this accountability is balanced with a trust and a faith in God's control, which means that when we have trials, that we aren't putting those above God or putting those as an excuse to trust in God. Um, I went back to a sermon from a couple years ago. I think this was during COVID, and uh, I think there was a time when th that trial or just th things that were weren't what we wanted. That was what we were staring at, or some people were staring at. And there was a sermon that um, one thing that I really remember from it was to stare. Not to stare at the storm, but to stare at Jesus. And this is, again, this is just a reminder to me that my struggles aren't anything God can't, can't handle. And to stare at Jesus and not at the trial itself. And on the other end, it's also, this is also, um, so balancing this with that trust in God's control, it's, it also means that I don't put my own wisdom above God's wisdom. And... Um, it's as simple as if it isn't from God's word, what I think is right isn't always right. Um, and yeah, so that trust word, it's that Proverbs 3, to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Um, and so I can't make... Oh yeah, the you out. <laughs> so so I, I can't make Seth grow the way I want him to or behave the way I want him to. I can't make things at work go as smooth as I want them to, no matter how much I try to force it. And the biggest one is that I can't save anyone in my own strength. All of these things, whatever we do, God is the one in control of the outcome. And there's two Proverbs that I've written here. So the first one, they're both from chapter 16. The first one is, in their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. And the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. So again, what I'm learning is that everything we do on this earth, it is as a servant and a steward, a servant to God and a steward, a steward to those that God entrusts us with. And this is, um, I think just all of this, it's, it's, it's centered around that Jeremiah 9. Because we think we know what is best sometimes, and we, we take pride sometimes in things of this earth above um, 
what Jeremiah 9 says, and so I'll just read that. So this is what the Lord says. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, who ex exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll punish all who are circumcised only in the flesh. Egypt, Judah, Edom, Ammon, Moab, and all who live in the desert and distant places. For all these nations are really uncircumcised, and even the whole house of Israel is un uncircumcised in heart. And so when I reflect on these trials or tests in the context of John 15, it's a reminder to myself that God is pruning us so that we aren't just circumcised in flesh, but that we are circumcised and clean from the inside out. And that these are opportunities to grow closer to him. Um, and so will we trust in him or will we trust in ourselves? And it's back to, yeah, so as a servant, will we obey the master who is God and not go above him? And as a steward, will we do our part with what the owner, God, um, uh, entrusts to us? and then trust the rest unto him. And I think that's where, where I've gotten to so far, and it's something I want to keep reading about because it's, it's not easy, and all of, the, all of these things are just they're easy to know and to read and to, to repeat to yourself, but to be able to put those things into practice is, is, is another, a whole other thing. Um, and I just read this earlier, oh, I'm sorry, I just wrote this earlier as well, and I'll just add it to the end. It's another thing that God has, I guess, been teaching me is to see beyond myself. That we aren't alone in our trials because the body is going through it too. And above all this, that we have a God who is guiding us through, it, through, through all of it. That if we remain in him, that he will remain in us. Um, and yeah, that's it. Oh, um, and I'm supposed to be opening the floor. <laughs> is, that, is that this one, Joey? Yeah. I asked Queer Air because I think he, he. Oh, wait, yeah. Is it. I'm just opening the floor? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. <laughs> queer Air. <laughs> 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 Why well, ask if I just say his name? <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Yes, I'm Yeah, I had a couple of verses ready, just in case we didn't have the time. <laughs> um, I wasn't going to share, but after the messages today, I think I should. Um, it's funny how God makes it relevant. Um, so, yeah, so I was just reflecting as well um, for this year. Um, definitely felt like there's been more situations where God has put something or someone in our hearts to pray for. So whether it be someone from across the world in Korea or someone at the festival or even Jay, which I hadn't talked to for many, many years, um, he still called us to pray um, as a body. So I think um, overall um, it's been a good, good thing. Um, and yeah, I just, I'm just encouraged that we can come together and pray for people outside of this church or this, this um, um, outside the ark. Um, I was just going to read from um, 1 Timothy verse 2 because um, the scripture tells us that we should pray and we should always pray without ceasing. Um, yeah, pray for our leaders, pray for our, our enemies, for non believers, pray for everyone, right? So I was just going to pray this, oh, sorry, um, read this short passage. It says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, um, for kings and all those in, in authority, that we may live, live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind. The, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Um, this has now been witnessed 
to um, at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. Um, so I'll just leave it there. But yeah, like the messages before me, um, we should always think um, Christ-like and have everyone, you know, our desire should be like Jesus, where everyone should be saved. Um, and sometimes, you know, the best thing we could do, we might not be able to support people financially or go across the globe, but we can always pray for people. And, and that's a good thing. Yeah, so we should be like Jesus and we should try and lead them to repentance and salvation. Um, and just when you think that prayer is useless, it's not, right? Um, so yeah, just want to encourage the church to keep doing that um, for the coming year. Um, if he puts something or someone in your heart, um, don't ignore it because there's a reason why he's put it in your heart. Um, and you can always bring it to the church so we can pray for it as a body. Um, because, yeah, you never know how long we're going to last here. Um, and you don't know how long that person or that something has, has left, right? Um, I was also reading this quote from Charles um, Spurgeon. Um, it says, If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped around their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled... Let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions, and let not one go unwarned and unprayed for. I thought that was pretty powerful. So yeah, um, we should do everything in our power, um, and the, uh, the very least we could do is pray for them, right? Um, and the second thing I just want to share is from First John. So I think it probably relates to um, Marco sharing. Um, and I think it's going to be more relevant to us in the coming years. First uh, John chapter 5, verse 1 to 12. Uh, everyone who believes that Jesus is, Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for every, everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Um, yeah, so let's keep each other accountable and help each other continue to walk um, in our faith so that we, we don't stumble like the world and the rest of the world is happening right now. Um, like in his share, in Marco's sharing, let's help each other be the overcomers that we should be um, in that final stage. Um, I was just thinking about these things and um, yeah, being a parent, the, ki the kids came to my mind again. Like it's, it's crazy how many kids there are. You can hear them in the, in the other room, but I feel like it's a bit, scary that we have so many kids because of the world and what's going to be their situation when they grow up. Um, yeah, so just trying to encourage everyone that we have people um, learning from us that we should take it seriously. Um, we need to try and raise godly kids and to do that we need godly parents and a godly church. Um, and like Mark said, yeah, we should always be doing our part anyway. Um, so, yeah, I'll just end with one more passage um, in Romans 8. Um, it says, For I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we, now, we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in pains of childbirth until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved, now hope that is seen is not hope, 
for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep, too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what's in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he called also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say? To these things, if God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also how will he not also with him graciously give us all all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God who indeed is interceding for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height or depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, I thought that was really encouraging. Um, no matter what, what we're experiencing now, it's nothing compared to what is to come. Um, yeah, that's it for me. Now the floor is open. <laughs> Uh, just not just recently, months ago or years ago, the impression of uh, the Ministry of Intercession, and, and we can see on how like Alep, just the Lord put the the guy from Israel on her heart, and and we know on how God putting people on our heart to pray, and and God just like strengthen me when I'm hearing a, a sermon from the television. Uh, the, the pastor mentioned, what if, if you are in a, in a room and there is a fire and you have the chance to help those people to be rescued, you, are you not going to rescue them? Yeah, so since then it just, it just became like, Lord, we know we are only a vessel, but you are the ones going to rescue spiritually. It, it became, a, the, the illustration is physical, but within my heart it became like uh, spiritual to uh, the, the word rescue, on how the Lord uh, impressed in my heart to pray for people, to intercede for people. Uh, he's, giving, he's giving them in our heart, we have burden, and to intercede. And, but there are cases that like you keep on praying and praying and then you spiritually or you sometimes, uh, Lord, uh, sometimes do, uh, do I have the, the like uh, enthusiasm to pray? <laughs> yeah. And then, but and then, on how, uh, and we know on how the Spirit of God is, is reminding us, Jesus doesn't stop interceding for us. We, we uh, uh, see these people on how 
as a senior and, and see these people and how I see you as a senior and how I rescue you. And these people on how they I re rescue. And Lord, what is our part? Uh, I, I, I'm asking a lot from the Lord. And then there should be a connection uh, as a part of the body, like what it was mentioned last Sunday, when we pray, uh, our, uh, be sure you are a part of the body. Uh, Jesus is the head, it's just connection. And because, you know, Lord, I know, I know, it's you who's doing the rescue. We just vessel, we're just praying that you are doing the rescue. You're, you're touching them, Lord. And there is one that, uh, one person that the Lord he sees a friend that the Lord gave us. It's not just for me, even my Christian friend, to pray for her. Whenever I talk to his friend, a former employee, last week, she's in the ICU. Yeah, she's in the ICU, and we've been praying for her when we meet her. And uh, actually, I, I even talked to her. She, she, she got in Paisima, and uh, she's smoking. She's still smoking. And then I, I, I keep on telling her, you know, even you will get angry with me, please stop smoking. Because you are just enfor re 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 reinforcing your empyzema. And then I, I cannot do it, Divina, I cannot do it. But the Lord will help you. It's like a chance for me to, to tell about on how God can help them. But the Lord will help you. Oh, you, 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 you guys are religious. But and then I, I got a text uh, two days ago from her. Hey, I'm in the ICU. But thank God, uh, she, uh, he's think, she's thanking God that the Lord sent her a, a Christian nurse. And what on her text to me, you know, God dreams. And I remember you guys as well on how you are spiritual, on how you are religious, and, 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 and this God reigns. So I thank God. And, and the one who works with me as, is a Christian as well. We have to thank God, and God is uh, in simple conversation, and we don't know how, because like Mark said, sometimes, Lord, uh, it's, not, it's not on our strength. We don't know how to share, uh, uh, but you work in simple ways, and, and just in, uh, we just um, pray that you will be in control because we can say a lot of verses, we can say, but once you don't touch these people, you don't rescue them, uh, uh, it's nothing. It's, it's not by might nor by power, but by spirit, say the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to add something about intercession because uh, it's not what people think. You're not just praying for others. When God really puts you in intercession, like you, he puts you in their shoes and you find yourself pleading with him as if you were the guilty, as if you are the one that's guilty of what actually they're guilty of. You're praying the prayers they're not praying. You're literally standing in their place, which is Christ-like. Because remember, he took our sin, He took, though he's sinless, he took our sin upon himself to intercede for us. Right? But sometimes, God will have you intercede for people and you, just the normal rational part of your head's like, this person, this person, you know. So recently I had that experience because, you know, when you've been battling against false teachers for 30 years, you can get a bit depressed or, you know, like you bang your head on the wall so you've got a giant bruise on your head. Like. And God said to me, whose law have they broken? Whose law have they broken? His. Who then is owed the debt for their sin? Or oh, it's you, Lord. And he said, so if I forgive it, if I forgive it, is it not forgiven? Who then can bring a charge? 
if the one to whom the debt is owed forgives the debt. And I'm like, yeah, that makes sense, Lord. Then he says from the scripture, and this is what I wanted to leave with you. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. He has the sovereign authority that nobody else has. Because it's his law. It's not my law. It's not your law. It's his law. So the debt of sin is owed only to him. Even if you were offended, the debt is owed to him. So he has the power uniquely to cancel the debt if he elects to cancel it. Of course they still have to come to repentance and all those things, but as we just heard, he is able. He is able and if we are and if we are willing to pray putting aside the fact that obviously they're not going to heaven at the moment, that's why we're praying. Obviously they need to repent. Well that's why we're praying. And if they won't pray, then I will pray in your shoes. You know? And sometimes that you get spiritual backlash. You get God will let you endure. It, you know, but that makes you decide. I, am I really in it to the in it to win it, or am I just a tourist? You know, I don't want to be a tourist. <laughs> I'm a useless tourist, right? So I just wanted to share that. Even concerning those people who seem beyond rescuing, as I'm sure Rabbi Saul would have seemed completely beyond rescuing to any of the apostles, right? Wouldn't he? He would have seemed, are you kidding me? You know, there's no way that guy's going to be a Christian. And then he becomes the greatest of the apostles, right? Don't write anybody off. So do we have someone closing in prayer? Whoever that is? Lord, um, thank you for everything, Lord. Thank you for, um, once again, um, helping us to understand your word and sharing it, sharing it to one another, Lord. Um, Lord, I um, just want to pray for the next year coming, Lord. Um, guide us and help us to stand, Lord, uh, especially on the, on the challenges on the way, Lord. Um, we don't know when you're coming, Lord. Help us to be ready, um, especially with the testimony coming um, th that has been shared today. That we've been praying for others, Lord. Um, and um, thank you for the fellowship that you've given us. And I pray that um, the others as well um, can do the same. And um, thank you for providing us what we need and keeping us safe, Lord. And I pray for those who are going for vacation, Lord, um, protect them, keep them safe. And for those who can't make it today, um, who are sick, Lord, heal them, Lord. Bless them, Lord. Bless us all. Amen.